Hello and welcome to the Transmission Podcast. For more information on Transmission and what we do, you can head over to our website. The link for our website can be found in the show notes or the YouTube description down below. Enjoy this session and thank you for joining us. Good evening, everyone. It's good to be with you once again. And um, we are, you, you've got two sessions of me tonight. Sorry about that. But um, there's um, probably, again, a bit more than we could do than we ha can do in two hours. So we'll, um, we'll try and speed things up. And Jason, your job is to sort of show there's five minutes, there's 10 minutes or so left so that I can speed things up. But um, um, this is really this whole, this whole part of transmission. So where we do what is called um, the technical word for it would be hermeneutics. Um, but it's really the discipline or the 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 the, the, yeah, the discipline of interpreting scripture is what we're doing in, in in this particular session, which is one of the big sort of strands of the two years that we have in transmission. Um, this is really the stuff that really gets me excited. Okay, so so I'm passionate about this, and I think what we what we're doing, what we're going to be doing, even tonight, but. What we will be doing throughout the, the year and even the two years um, when we, when we uh, zoom into this part of transmission, where we're going to be looking at the different genres, the different types of literature in the Bible, and what are the specific tools of interpretation when you get to particular genres, to particular um, literature types. Um, I think it's so exciting because... It enables anyone, really anyone, to if you use these principles, these tools, and you apply it to the scripture, then it doesn't mean that we're going to be infallible. It's not going to mean that we get everything perfect, um, but it will help us. It will enable us to understand God's word uh, so that we can better communicate God's word. Which, and that is the burden, really, of transmission. That's why, we, that's why we're here. Just to say big picture, and then we're going to zoom into this session. Um, what we're going to do is in the first session, there's a bit of groundwork that we will have to do in the first bit of our time now in this first hour, but then we'll work towards hopefully by the end of this session, I'll, I'll, I would have given you six tools that if you can remember these six tools and whenever you come to a passage, if you can use these tools, think of a toolbox and there's six tools in the box that we're going to look at. And if you'll be uh, using those, then, then it will help you in um, understanding God's word and, and teaching God's word. That's what we're going to do in the first session. Then in the second session, we're going to use those tools on a specific passage. And we're going to try and do that together so that by the end of our second session tonight, after having looked at a passage together, um, Lord willing will be at what, what is the main point of that passage, having used the, the tools? Those of you who were last year in transmission, we were going to probably be using the same passage that we did there. It's just because it's a passage that works well in looking at all the different tools together. But even if you've done it before, I mean, it will be good to do it again. Because the idea is not to get to the right answer tonight. It is to work through the process. And you can never do that enough. Okay. So then, first session, uh, what we're going to be doing now is um, you can open your, your manuals or your, your textbooks to page 14. I think at least in mine it's page 14. Yep, it's that one, which is the general steps of interpretation. There is how, and this might even take us a good 10, 15 minutes, which we probably don't have, but it is important. There's, there's certain things that massive, massive, massive assumptions that we make as we come to the session. Now, in a sense, we probably can just skip it in this thing because we, we here probably share certain, let's, let's call it evangelical convictions, and that's probably why you're sitting here. Um, but there's certain things that, that are important. So I want to try and quickly run through certain principles before we actually get to the tools, okay? Um, and that is to say, they're, they're, they're probably, as we think of interpreting the Bible, there are four assumptions that we have in this room four evangelical convictions that we have as we come to the Bible, as we try and do this discipline of interpreting the Bible, okay, and, and, and it's the following. Um, I'm going to just write them on the board. Um, 
Uh, I still don't know how much I'm going to say now, so this can be dangerous. Revelation. Uh, inspiration. This is not in your book. You can probably scribble this down somewhere if you, if you want to. You don't have to. Uh, illumination. Ilu. Somebody help me spell illumination. Illumination. And contemplation. And I'm still looking for a better word contempt for this one. Okay, now, now like I say, actually I wish and we should actually remember this maybe, Jason, for next year. I think we should be spending a whole session just talking in depth through this, actually looking at the Bible uh, on this. I'm not so sure about the last one, but those are fairly standard evangelical doctrines even, the first three. And I think that one is very necessary whenever we, we do the whole work of interpreting the Bible. And I'll say a bit more about it. These four things um, or, or doctrines then uh, is important for this. Revelation is saying that our conviction is that, that firstly there's a God and that the God who is there is a revealing God. He's a God who has revealed himself. He's a God who has created us and pursues humanity in order to be in relationship with us. And in relationship, communication is the essence of relationships. And he is the initiator in this relationship. He's the initiator in communicating. And he is therefore a speaking God. If we had the time, we would go to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, which I think is absolutely foundational to this doctrine, the doctrine of revelation. Remember, go, go back quickly, God reveals himself in two ways, theologically speaking. There is what we call general revelation or natural revelation, God revealing himself in nature. I think Romans 1 makes that point. Uh, Psalm 19 makes that point. Okay. Then there is what you call special revelation, God revealing himself in a special way that he can be known and that is a saving way. Okay, and, and that is what we're talking about here. And as God reveals himself in this world in a special saving way to humanity, um, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 to 3 is important. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says, In the past, God has spoken to us at various times and in various ways through the prophets, um, I'm paraphrasing. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by son, by means of in his son. And so that's a very important um, passage because what it tells us that, um, that the God who is there is a revealing God. He has revealed himself throughout history, throughout salvation. History has revealed himself both in his um, actions and in his words, he has revealed himself, and his revelation progressively culminates in the person of Jesus, who is the perfect revelation. In the fullness of time, Jesus comes as the full revelation of God's word and God's work. Okay, that's Hebrews chapter 1 to 3. That is utterly, utterly important if we want to interpret the scriptures because it starts with this thing that I think we assume as we come here, and that is that God is a speaking God. God has spoken. Okay, so that is probably the, whoops, the daisy. That's probably here what you want to, uh, I want to write something else there. God has spoken. Conviction one. Inspiration then is to say that the God who has spoken has, has um, by his spirit caused is not the right word probably. He has inspired is sometimes the word we use, but you can get muddled up with the idea. By, but the God who has spoken speaks to us by means of human People, authors, that by his spirit caused, uh, he caused by his spirit those human authors to write down his work and his words in what we call scripture. That is the doctrine of inspiration. So you can think of 2 Timothy, 
chapter 3, verse 15 and 16 is one of the classic texts, as you would know. The, talking about the sacred writings, Paul talks about the sacred writings um, which are able to make us wise for salvation in Christ Jesus. He goes on, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, all scripture, all graphe, is God-breathed. It is, and that's the word for spirit, it is by God's spirit that he has that that um, that he has spoken, he, he's revealed himself, and it through people by his spirit, and we find it in the in the in the graphe in the sacred writings in scripture. Uh, two Peter chapter one is the other classic text on that, especially verse twenty and twenty one. Again, I'm paraphrasing where Peter says that 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 God has um, by his spirit um, caused the the the, the prophets to, to, to say what he wants us to know. Okay, I'm paraphrasing it. You can read this. If we had time, we could look, look at the passage. Why that is important, as we do, as we come to the Bible, to interpret to the Bible again, we believe that God has spoken, conviction one. Secondly, in the doctrine of inspiration, that it is written, that the God who is speaking to us in a special salvific way spoke to us through people by his spirit written on words, Old and New Testament. And that is, and that is the salvific way, the, the perfect way then that he has spoken to us. We believe that that is an is, is a infallible, inerrant, perfect word that we then have, that God has spoken he does not lie. He's spoken um, through, through, the, um, through the author's Old and New Testament. Illumination, again, important in this whole thing that we talk about when we talk about uh, interpreting the Bible, is still the work of the Spirit. By the way, all of this is the work of the Spirit. Um, it's still the work of the Spirit, but that's on the side of us then, who, 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 in, who come to God's Word, who reads God's word, and it's the work of the Spirit, many passages like that. Think of Psalm 119, verse 34 is one example of that. Or Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 to 18 makes that point. Lots and lots of places. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 makes this point. Um, is that it is God the Holy Spirit that illuminates us, that enables us, that enables us to not only understand then God's word, but believe God's word, which is utterly crucial when you do this whole thing about inspiration. By the way, kind of why praying is very important whenever you want to interpret God's word. It's super important. Okay? So if God has spoken, it is written, illumination, uh, it, conviction is, uh, we, we can understand We can understand because the God who has revealed himself and who has caused it to be written down is also the one then that, that enables us to understand uh, um, understand his word. Um, the fourth thing, though, that I would want to add in there, and these things are fairly, whenever you read any sort of classic evangelical book on interpretation, that's what you will, you'll hear. I think this is necessary to be put in there, um, and that is contemplation. And why I want to put that in is to say there's a danger that you can come to the Scriptures and even then just then, if you just stop there, make revelation nothing really more than just simply information. There's a real danger in that, that we can fill our heads with a bunch of stuff about God but it's not really, there's something more than information happening. It's communication that's happening. And for that, uh, you know, and for that, I, I think um, this idea of contemplation, I couldn't come up with a better word. And I only thought about it a few minutes ago. So, so I'm testing this out on you. Is, um, is, is really important. Okay. Um, it is, it is. And you see this, you see this all throughout scripture. So one example is Hebrews chapter three, um, verse uh, six. It says, um, as the Holy Spirit says, present tense, do not harden your, and then it quotes 
Psalm, Psalm 90, 95, I think. Um, Do not harden your hearts as they did in Mizpah and Meribah, going back to Exodus. Now, now, again, I wish we had the time for that. But the point is, according to the writer of Hebrews, he's speaking to New Testament believers, quoting a passage in the Old Testament, which is quoting another passage in the Old Testament. And he says to them, the Holy Spirit, present tense, is saying something to you. So, and do not harden your hearts. And so there's, there's something more than just simply... It, gaining information as we come to the scripture, it's if God is speaking to us, if God is speaking to us, um, there's a real work of listening to him that we need to be doing as we are interpreting the scriptures. It is possible to study the scriptures and even to understand it, but you're not listening to the God who's speaking. And what we want to be doing when we're interpreting the scripture is we don't want it to be a cold, abstract, academic work. It is a personal, relational thing. And that's why um, if, if it can, we can understand it. Um, and the, the, the fourth conviction is, is that we should commune. Commune is just a sort of an old word to say this fellowship. That, that again, that's the, and I, and I want us to, to, to have that conviction as we come to the scriptures, is that we are not just simply studying for the sake of knowledge, for intellectual and knowledge. We are studying and we are interpreting so that we can have fellowship with God, so that we can, um, so that we can know him. And so um, we're going to... Um, I don't know if I don't have the time with me, but um, but I, but I maybe I want I, I want to leave it I want to leave it there. Um, God has spoken; it is written. We can understand it, and the purpose of it is to have fellowship, to commune with God. Okay, and that is just by introduction. As we get to um, to tonight's idea, we're going to end up in the session having tools, um, but the big idea is for us to. To understand why we're doing this, because we want to meet with God. That's what we want to do whenever we come to the scriptures and we want to interpret it. Any questions at this stage before we before we continue? I don't know if there's any any thoughts, comments that you might have at this stage. Thank you. Yes. Just I thought about certain certain um, translations. <coughs> hmm. So. I know people that do what translation, you know, and then that, I don't know how full they are with the Holy Spirit so that they do the right translation. Am I saying something funny now? No, 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 no. No, so, and again, remember, in a sense, all of our translations are just translations. You know, unless you read the, the, the original, you know, we all, we all, um, in all our languages and all the variant. The, the, the different translations that you have in those languages, in a sense, are uh, interpreting, you know, what the original is saying. And, and you probably, I think it's the next chapter, we're not going to look at it in Fee and Stuart, but I would encourage you to read chapter 2 in the Fee and Stuart book, because the cha uh, chapter 2 is, is really about different translations. And they would tell you there that, you know, there's a spectrum in translations between what we would call the more literal translations, and they list there a bunch of those um, translations to the more um, paraphrase on this side, and probably in the middle what they call dynamic equivalence, which is a bit of trying to have a tension between being more literal and more on the paraphrase side. And, and, and the, I, I, think, I, I think there's a place for all those different kind of translations. There's even a place for more on the paraphrase side, just know what you're getting yourself into. But when you are studying the scriptures, if you have to preach or you have to teach a Bible study or maybe do a talk, I think it's always better to be on the, more, the side of the translations that are more literal translations, that do less of the interpretive work. And it's, but sometimes it doesn't read as easily as some of the other ones, but it helps you to... To, for you to do more of the, in, the, the interpretation work and not the, the Bible translators doing it. 
But have the different translations. I get different translations whenever you study the Bible. Sometimes it's quite helpful. Um, but I'm not really answering your question, but, but you're right. It's, it's, I wouldn't say it's a, it's, it's a, it's a problem. You know, that, that, that you get various translations. So it's a blessing in a sense. You want to look at all of them if you can. Um, yeah, Eric, you wanted to say something. No, when you, uh, on contemplation, when you said uh, commentation, so on, what crossed my mind was when Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will do what you will desire. So yeah. that leads you into prayer. So Yes, yeah, yeah. So that, Word of God leads you into prayer. And yeah. That's where you start communicating. Yeah. And that inspires and you start understanding if you do not understand what's actually meant. Yes, yes. And and there's actually there's a great brilliant, you're absolutely right. And there's a great there's a great um it's a gr great book by Eugene Peterson called Working the Angles. And he's got a chapter where he speaks on, on this and, and 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 just saying that this is it is just helpful for us as we come to the Bible to remember, uh, remember the idea of speaking, that God is speaking, and ultimately what we are doing here is listening. You know, and that those two really go together. It's possible for us to stop there, but we're not really listening to God. And this does mean lots of... Um, Prayer, I think this is why, like, for instance, in Psalm 119, it often talks about, I meditate over your word. You know, that idea of meditating over the word, that's what we're talking about here, listening. It's not just simply that I know what is the main point of the text because I've done a nice academic thing. I've, I'm, I'm letting it soak in. I'm, I'm prayerfully being silent, reflecting, meditating. I'm, I'm, I realize that, that, that this book, behind this book is a speaking God. He spoke, he spoke through people who wrote it down, but he's a God speaking to me today. And so I want to, so it's more than just a head thing. That's the way, I just want to get us away from that. That's really the, the big idea there. It's almost, it's almost contemplating the living thing to the transport. A absolutely. It is, it is certainly, in fact, I wrote that down here, not in the word transformed, but it is the idea of it is towards um, obedience, it's towards um, being transformed, becoming. It's, it's in order to become um, more like him or more like he wants me to be. Yeah, definitely. Great. So that's all by introduction. Um, Jason, how much time is left in this? Uh, Wow, amazing. Okay, so can I, I'm going to take this out. We're quickly going to talk through, through, um, through page 14. So I'm not going to um, redraw that little, no, I am going to redraw that. Uh, the, the top bit, God, them, us. Okay. As we think through interpreting scripture and everything I just said now, this is in a sense um, trying to put that in, 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 a, in a little diagram for us. It is helpful for us to say God is speaking. Remember, he spoke through people who wrote it down. As we come to the Bible, though, God is not directly speaking to you and me. He is speaking to us, and he is directly speaking to us. But what I'm trying to say is he spoke a word to a people before. Everything in Scripture is a word that God spoke not directly to us, but to someone else at some stage when he revealed himself and it was written down in Scripture. You know, and so, and, um, and so God spoke to, to them then, in the past, and he speaks to us now. But the way that God speaks to you and me when we open the scriptures is through the word that he spoke to them then. Okay, is, is that unclear? Please to say if I have to, like, so uh, th this is just, this is a very important um, corrective as we come to scripture is that 
you open up the scriptures and you're asking, what is God saying to me today? But what God is saying to me today is a word that he said to someone else before. And it is the word that he spoke to them that I then need to understand what, how is God speaking that word to me today? All right. Um, because otherwise what you can do is you can open up. It's always good to, um, it's always good to uh, criticize your own people. I'm Afrikaans. I love being Afrikaans. I think it's a brilliant people. Okay. But like what my forefathers did, and I love them to bits, but what they did, the voortrekkers, is they would open the scriptures in the Grootrek. Okay, that's when they tried to get away from the Brits in the 1800s and went up into the north of the country. And they would open up the Old Testament and they would see the Old Testament stories and they would say, okay, God is leading us to a promised land. Um, and, and then, okay, so... That means that, you know, the people around us, we know that's, you know, that's, that's the heathen in the story and we are Israel in the story getting us to a promised land. That is taking that scripture and saying, rightly, God has spoken and he's speaking to us and it's through this book, but it's taking it in a wrong way because it's not asking what did that mean for them then then trying to figure out what it's saying for me now. It's straight going there. And it's not only the Afrikaans people who did this. This is what liberation theology on the other side does exactly the same thing. It does the, make the same mistake. It's, you know, we are Israelites in Egypt that, that are being liberated. It's the same thing, taking it directly, not doing this exercise. That's a conversation for another day. The point is, this is a responsible way of reading scripture. This is the study of exegesis. According to Fee and Stewart in the chapter that you read, is understanding what did it mean for the, for the original audience. That's the study of exegesis. This, according to uh, um, Fee and Stewart in the chapter that you read, is what they call, and I, not, they say it's the study of hermeneutics. But it gets confusing because hermeneutics is also the word for all of this. But that's the way that they use it. Exegesis is what, is what did it mean for them then? And that's what we do when we interpret the Bible. Hermeneutics is what does it mean for us today? Both those things you need to do whenever you try to understand, whenever you're trying to interpret Scripture. So, now we're getting... Um, I'm going to put it in a formula. Interpretation is exegesis plus hermeneutics. If you come to any passage in the Bible, this is what you're doing. You're doing exegesis and you're doing, in the words of the and Stewart, hermeneutics. I'm just summarizing the chapter. Exegesis, whenever you do exegesis, there's two sub exercises. It's you, you considering the context of your passage and you are considering the content in the passage. Okay, I'll get to hermeneutics now. And we're going to do this later on. So, so I'll give you an opportunity to ask questions. I just want to draw it out for us. So you've got a passage. You want to interpret your passage. The first thing that you want to do is what did this, what did this passage, what did God say to the original audience who got this passage? So it's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. What did this passage mean to the original audience? That is the study of exegesis. Context, you're considering the context of your passage. You are considering the content in the passage. In context, there are, again, if you double-click on context, there's two subdivisions of context. It is considering what is the historical context and considering what is the literary context. Okay. 
so that it's not just me talking. What, what do we mean by historical context? Anyone? What is the historical context of a passage? Great. Brilliant. Brilliant. So that is, that, is that, that part of interpretation, as you look at your passage, that question that you're trying to answer, what was the location, what was the original situation um, in which these words were spoken? Who, would, who was it spoken to? By whom was it spoken to? Are there any events? As far as I can, because when you come to Scripture, it's in a sense like hearing one side of a telephone conversation. What you're trying to do um, in especially historical context is trying as much as we can to figure out what's on the other side of the, the, the conversation, the other side of the line. Okay. So it's that. It's, it's what's the occasion? What's the situation? Anybody else wanted to add to that? Happy. What do we mean by literary context? The way it fits in the book. Yes. Yes. Great. So literary context is, is recognizing that the particular verse that I'm interpreting is not an island on its own. That verse or that sentence is part of a bigger conversation. So that sentence is part of a paragraph. That paragraph is part of a chapter. That chapter is part of maybe a, a unit or a block. That block or unit is part of a, of a book. That book is part of a testament. Uh, or, uh, and that testament is, is, is part of a, a bigger story, the this, this story of God that we considered in the beginning. And in a sense, um, whenever you, whenever you and in a, we all do this to some extent, but whenever you want to interpret the Bible, apart from figuring out historical context, where, where is this, what's going on in the situation, you, you're asking yourself, where does this fit into the bigger, the bigger, word that God is speaking. Okay. Anybody want to add to that or any comments or questions on that? Is this kind of obvious? Well, I think it is. Hopefully. Right? Good. Okay. By content, by content then, um, and we're going we, to we're gonna, uh, unpack this a bit later, but by content, there's... Uh, what, what we refer to as uh, meaning of words. And grammatical relationships. It's even more than that. It's, it's all those kind of, again, we, we, we often do some of this intuitively whenever we read any words whether it's in the Bible or you're reading a magazine or you're reading a recipe book, whatever, we do this. But you want to consider the content in your passage. And it will be things like um, looking out for repetition. Yo, my spelling. Leave a lunt. How do you spell repetition? Oh, thank you. E, repetition. It, it was an I. You see, I knew. No, that doesn't look right. Something's hopelessly wrong there. Is that right? R E P I. There's an I. Yes. Okay. Okay. It's just it's an ugly I, but it's there. Repetition. Can, um, so again, this is important. Whenever you come to a passage, when you come to a passage and the same word is repeated, uh, and the same word is repeated seven times in ten verses. Then it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to to sort of think, you know, this is kind of a big deal to the writer. So, so if you know, if, if we are speaking in the conversation, I'm using the word rugby, and I'm using it thirty times in ten minutes. Then you sort of know I'm, I'm talking about rugby. 
Okay. Now, in a sense, we forget that. You know, we forget that often when we come to the scripture. We don't look at what are the words or the phrases that are repeated by the writer. And so repetition is super, super important. You want to be looking out for repetition. What is it? Thank you. I knew that. I knew that. It did look very well. Thank you. Great. Okay, so repetition is important. Connective words. Connective words. Connective words are, are those hinge words between words, sentences, and paragraphs. Connective words are and, and therefore, so that, but, in order that, all those kind of words. Think of a hinge on the door. It's the, it's, it's the hinge between the connecting words, clauses, sentences, paragraphs. Whenever you interpret scripture, you want a, a highlighter or a colored pen, and you want to be highlighting every single connective word. For me, I think, especially in the New Testament letters, it is the most important tool you can use, is to look out for the connective words. Why? What, why, why, is, why are the connective words so important when we try to interpret Scripture? Anyone? It explains. It explains? In what way does it explain? Well, it, gives, it makes like a statement, and then it goes on to explain that statement. Great. Great. Yeah, yeah. I would think it also gives you some kind of coherence. Yes. You yes. You can trace one idea down. That's. It does explain, but it explains in that way, I think, and I think you're spot on. I think that's the that's the big thing, it's, and this is especially it's it's important in in lots of the different types of literature, but especially in New Testament letters, which is highly um, didactic, highly argumentative it, it reads paul reads like lawyer documents it is rational especially in the new testament letters so it's argumentation so and so logic what is the logical flow of the argument is absolutely crucial and you can only know how does these all this these words relate with one another if you if you can trace the connective words. So connective words are super important. So repetition, connective words. Another one that's very important is, have we got five minutes left? Fifteen. Minutes. 15. Minutes. You're lying to me. I see what you're doing. Um, the other thing that's very important is distinguishing between and highlighting both indicatives and imperatives. Big words. It's probably easier words, but it won't sound as impressive as these two, so we're going to go for these two. What is indicatives? Anyone? Yeah, indicative is, to put it simply, as a statement. It's a truth claim. It's a, it, is, it, is a, it is a sentence that is, yeah, stating a fact, or that is proposed as a fact, at least. Okay, that's an indicative. What is imperatives? Command. command. So, so imperatives are commands. It's such a helpful tool, this, that we so often... Again, I think when we often, even when we're talking to each other, that is how we're making sense of the data you know, going back and forth between us, but somehow we forget that when we forget that the Bible is God speaking to us through these human authors. And so you want to always in a passage, and again, especially because, especially in the New Testament letters, you want to be, you want to highlight the imperatives, especially. You want to highlight to say, where are the imperatives? Where are the clear indicatives? And again, given the connective words, how do the indicatives and the imperatives relate to each other? Because usually they do in some form or another, especially in the New Testament letters. There's no imperative in the New Testament without, without an indicative. When God calls us to do stuff, it's always because of a truth claim. 
You are God's holy people. Therefore, connective word, flee from sexual immorality. You know, or, and, and lots and lots of those. God comes with, there's a truth claim, there's indicative, and the indicative leads to imperative. You want to see those. If you've got a big text and you have to preach 20 verses, it really helps you if you can see, oh, but there's three imperatives in the passage. And these three imperatives, these three commands, relate with these bunch of indicatives in these ways. Okay, so you want to be looking out for that. Um, is that still fairly clear? Um, another, the, the, other, the other one here that I think is also important is, and then I'm going to stop for now with this, is, is to look out in a passage for metaphor, metaphors or images, or illustrations, especially maybe illustrations or metaphors. It depends on your genre. When you're in the Psalms, they come in the form often of metaphors. You know, picture, so it's picture language, okay? And so depending on your, we'll do this when we get to the specific genres, but if you're in the Psalms, you want to be looking out for metaphors the whole time. What is the picture language? Because it's poetry. Poetry is full of imagery. And so you want to be looking out for what images. So, so and we'll do this when we get to the Psalms, when Paul says, and the, the mountains are clapping their hands. Okay? Mountains can't clap hands. Okay? So that's an image. So you want to be, as you're trying to interpret that, you want to meditate, you want to stop, you want to reflect and think, I want to see, I want to, I want to see that idea of the mountains clapping their hands. What is it? What am I feeling when I see that image? What is God communicating through the image? But, you, 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 but you're looking out for the images. Paul often, sometimes there's metaphors, images, but it comes as illustration. There's often these illustrations. He would say, you know, um, that, that being one of God's workers is like being a, like being a farmer. It was like being the athlete. It was like being, like being a soldier, he says. So as in your passage, you want to be looking out. Is there any, any images here, any any illustrations that he's using. You want to stop. You want to reflect on those because he's not just saying that because he, he hasn't got anything better to do. It's like when we use illustrations, we use illustrations and talk so that people can understand better. So look out for the illustration because it's going to help you to understand. Okay. It's sort of obvious, but I think we miss this, or at least I do. Um, okay. I'm going to stop there and then... And then hermeneutics, remember, uh, hermeneutics, so exegesis, all of this that we've, that we've spoken about now is in a sense trying to determine what did that passage mean for the original audience. And we considered the context, historical and literary. We considered the content. And then we got a good idea of what it meant for them then. It's not always that easy to know, okay, but what does it mean for us today? For instance, the example that I used earlier, you know, so, so I'm reading the book of Joshua, okay, and I'm seeing in the book of Joshua that Joshua uh, and Israel, the Israelites are on their way, they are going into the promised land, and this is the promised land, and therefore they have to kill the Canaanites, okay? I need to try and understand, okay, but what does that mean for me? It's God's word and God is speaking to me. I'm doing this in my Bible study in the morning. And God is speaking to me today through this word that he spoke to a people before. That is, the, that is hermeneutics the, according to Fian Stewart. And, and if you doing hermeneutics, this is where systematic the theology and biblical theology comes in. That's why we're doing the stuff that we're doing in transmission. Everything that we do in transmission in two years is really just this. Okay? So in a sense, remember systematic theology, as we said before, is trying to just... Both of these are in a sense there to help you to be safe in your interpretation Systematic theology is saying, what does the whole Bible say about one particular subject? Biblical theology is saying, 
How does this theme trace throughout the, the story of the Bible? And so when I then read the book of Joshua, and I see here Joshua went into the promised land, and they conquered the promised land, then I remember this at least, you know, what, how, does prom, how is promised land used throughout Scripture? Um, how does that story develop? Well, Jesus, according to the New Testament, ultimately is the, is, is the ultimate Joshua. And according to the writer of Hebrews, and we're going to touch on this maybe a bit later, but according to the writer of Hebrews, the promised land is still ahead of us as we are following Jesus into that promised land. And we're not going to go into that now, but you see the, the, it's the biggest story of the Bible that then helps me to understand what is God saying to me today? He's, he's telling me um, to, follow, to follow Joshua. Uh, Joshua, Jesus is the strong and courageous one. God has given him a mandate. That's Jesus for me. Um, and that the Canaanites probably are sin in my life. You know, and it's whatever else is trying to make sure that I don't get into the promised land or whatever. The, the point is, we're, you're still busy interpreting Scripture, but what you're doing now is you're asking, what, did it, what does it mean for me today? In a sense, biblical theology is nothing different to literary context in its, in its bigger sense of the word, um, but, but especially that one is, is, is super important. Any last, uh, we're going to stop in th three minutes. Any, any last... Um, Thoughts or comments? Anything unclear at this stage? So I'm going to I'm going to summarize it, and then we'll stop for now, and then we're going to do an exercise. So to to summarize, when we when 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 we come to scripture, in order to interpret it, it's way more than us just doing a technical exercise. Fundamentally. What we're doing is that the God who has spoken and who has spoken in Scripture can be understood by me so that I can commune with him. And when I'm opening up the Bible for myself or for others, the idea is relationship with him. It is knowing him so that I can become increasingly in, that I can be changed in this relationship into the person that he wants me to be. Okay, that's, that's what we started off with. As I'm interpreting it, given everything that we said now, there's really six tools that I want you to remember. There will be specific tools in each of the genre. When we're going to consider Old Testament stories, there are certain tools in the toolbox that you only take out of the toolbox when you look at Old Testament narrative. When you come to the Psalms or to wisdom literature, there are particular tools in the toolbox that you'd only take out when you, when you look at poetry. When you look at apocalyptic, the apocalyptic genre, Book of Revelation or the Book of Daniel or bits of Ezekiel, there are particular tools for that toolbox that you only take out that are true for that literary type. When, when you come to New Testament epistles, there are particular tools that you take out of your toolbox only that are unique to that um, literature. And we will be looking at those when we get there. But there are six tools that are, in a sense, your bread and butter tools of interpretation. It doesn't matter in what genre you are in the Bible, these six in the toolbox you always use. And it's these ones. It is... Historical context, well, it's context, but it's historical context. Well, this, sorry, let me not put it there. I'm putting it here. It's historical and literary context. That's tool number one. As you consider the context, historical and literary, you could probably make it two. Secondly, and in no particular order, that's probably first in the order, but then it doesn't matter. Indicatives and imperatives. You consider, you look out, what are the commands? Are there any commands? What are the truth claims that are made? Um, thirdly, you consider, you, you look out for repetition. Fourthly, you look out for connective words. 
Fifthly, you try and look in your passage, wherever you are, for metaphor, images, or illustrations. Oh, I'm being naughty. Did I say six? I meant seven. Seven. Sorry, seven, yeah, it's the, it's, the, it's the holy number. Seven, you look out for editorial comments. Again, certain genres, it's more prevalent than in others. But editorial comments are those, sometimes the writer tells you, he gives you the answer. He gives you, the, yes. That's in Yeah. Oh, sorry, that is six. Seven is, it's, you, you, you try and place your passage in the bigger story of the Bible, ultimately. Is, is, is how does this fit into the big meta narrative? Now, I know that in a sense, I, that's partly what we do with literary context. But with literary context, often we mean the immediate literary context. Okay, so if you can remember those seven things, if you, if you can do those seven things when you come to any passage, you, you, you would have done well to be closer to what, what is going on here. What is God, what is God saying to me in, in this passage? How is he speaking to me and to the people that, that I'm ministering to. Okay. We're going to break till five past. We're going to break till five past.